How did Pokemon, the most successful media franchise in the world, go from making greatness to making this? Each new game seems to piss off more and more fans, dumbing things down and never innovating. This looks like a GameCube game scene. It's just the repeating water texture, the repeating stone texture. The creators know what's happening. They know the games aren't great. They just don't care anymore. The Pokemon games are no longer the focus of the companies behind the brand. But it didn't used to be this way. The old games captured generation after generation, pulling us along for each new adventure. Every age group was excited for what came next. And it all started in the 90s. At the end of the 20th century when I was growing up, if you weren't playing Pokemon on your Game Boy, you were watching the show. If you weren't watching the show, you were trading cards at school. And if you weren't doing that, you thought Digimon was cool and you had no friends. What? Yeah, dude, don't you know? It's all about the Pokemon video game now. But seriously, Pokemon took over the world at the time. I remember pleading with my parents to go see the Pokemon first movie in theaters as a kid. It was intense. It was emotional. It was everything a six-year-old kid could want from a movie. I mean, good hell. Seeing those Pokemon exhausted from fighting one another still gives me the feels. This is when Pokemania began. Backpacks, lunchboxes, headgear, underwear. If you could slap a Pikachu on it, you did. Even Jeff Bezos was mocking anybody that didn't know Pokemon. If you guys don't know what Pokemon is, you are... <laughs> and all this popularity, all this Pokemania can be traced back to those first two games. Unlike most media franchises, Pokemon didn't start as a book, a movie, or TV show. It started as a video game. And when those first Pokemon games released, they were like nothing we'd ever seen before. They had crazy looking creatures, an incredible world to explore, and it was a JRPG story I could actually follow, unlike some others. Let's just say if you had a Game Boy, you had Pokemon. And if you include Yellow Version, those first games sold over 45 million copies, surpassing Tetris as the best selling Game Boy title. Nintendo and Game Freak had struck gold. Just gold everywhere. From all this success, the Pokemon company was born with three companies at the helm, Nintendo, Creatures Inc., and Game Freak. These companies needed someone to manage the Pokemon brand, someone to oversee the TV shows, movies, the card game, and merchandise. The games were meant to be the focus of these three companies, and everything else was secondary. So with their new partnership in place and the Pokemon company managing the brand, Nintendo, Creatures Inc., and Game Freak got to work on their next series, Silver and Gold. Everything about this generation was awesome. It took the original formula and just dialed it up, adding new Pokemon, new features, and a whole new world to explore. Not to mention those colors really popped when you slapped the light on your Game Boy Advance. Oh, yeah. Game after game took Pokemon to new heights. And when the fourth and fifth generation rolled around, the series had really hit its stride. They had great animations, post-game content, pacing was on point, and new mechanics amplified that core gameplay. It felt like the series would just get better and better. But then something happened. In 2013, Pokemon X and Y was released, switching from a 2D world to a 3D. And sadly, that wasn't the only thing to change. The story was subpar, the animation stripped down to fit 3D, and the hand-holding was incessant. Not to mention the game had way less content than past entries. Let's just say long-term fans were not happy. Your fantasies can't ever be quenched, can they? But even after the screw up, things kept getting worse. Gen 7 was a slog with all the cutscene battles. Gen 8 was too easy, lacking way too much content at launch. And Gen 9 was a disgrace on all accounts, easily earning its spot as the worst Pokemon game in the series. While the games have been okay to mediocre since Gen 5, they had never come out completely broken. The players got even more pissed and they couldn't understand why the games were getting worse. How could the developers let this happen? This is where a lot of fans have been left confused. I mean, how can a game made by three prominent billion dollar companies look like this? Whose fault is it? Is it Game Freak, the company that develops the game? Is it Creatures Inc., the company that models and animates the Pokemon? Or is it Nintendo, the publisher? Most, of course, blame Game Freak. They're the ones developing the game. They should take the blame. Nintendo just publishes it, and I agree. But we should look past Game Freak for a second and focus our attention on Nintendo, the company that is renowned for giving us amazing games time and time again. The company known for its sequels, always reinventing the wheel and adding some new flavor. They care so much about making sequels better 
that they refused to make another Star Fox because Miyamoto didn't have any new ideas to bring to the game. And he wasn't particularly interested in making another Star Fox game with better graphics and better sound. So innovation matters. It matters a lot to Nintendo. But if that's the case, why let Pokemon slide into mediocrity? Why has Pokemon been stagnant for 10 years? Some may say Nintendo doesn't make the game, so it's not their fault. Or Nintendo only owns 32% of the Pokemon company, so they don't have full control over the games that release. This is where the truth comes out. Yes, Nintendo only owns 32% of the Pokemon company, but they do own 10% of Creatures Inc. And Game Freak's office is literally inside the building owned by Nintendo. Nintendo is the big brother here. As the publisher and the majority shareholder of Pokemon, since they own part of Creatures Inc., Nintendo can do whatever they want. They definitely aren't being bullied into letting the two other smaller companies release a busted ass game. Nintendo isn't a bystander. They know what is happening, they just don't care. You see, with all the other Nintendo IPs, Mario, Zelda, Metroid, etc., these franchises make most of their money off game sales. Wow. Crazy, I know. But let's look past the obvious and study the Mario franchise for a moment. The Mario IP has made $36 billion since 1981, and 30 billion of that is game sales. Cool, makes sense. The Zelda franchise has made around three and a half billion, with the majority of that money coming from game sales. Also makes sense. But Pokemon, an IP that is much younger than Zelda and Mario, has made over $90 billion, making it the most valuable media franchise in the world, more than Marvel, more than Mickey Mouse, more than almost every Nintendo franchise combined. And you know how much of that has come from game sales? Only 17 billion. Don't get me wrong, the Pokemon games make money, but they don't make what I call stupid money, where it feels like money is just being printed. Something else is printing money for the Pokemon company, and since the early 2010s, the Pokemon games took a back seat for this new cash cow, merchandise. Over two thirds of Pokemon's revenue comes from merch. $62 billion and counting with some websites saying a lot more. That cute EV plushie you have, or that weird Pikachu smelling perfume, these things are now the focus of Nintendo, Creatures Inc., and Game Freak, not the games. And when you look at it from a business perspective, it all makes sense. Who is Pokemon's core audience? Is it the 30 year olds like me who played Red and Blue in 1998? Is it the people that want a highly competitive experience or a world they can explore without being told where to go? No! It's the impressionable six year olds who are asking their mom and dad to buy them the newest Pokemon game. It's the new generation that will fall in love with the new Pokemon. <laughs> Most kids don't care if the game has endgame content. They're not angry when the game is too easy. It's probably the perfect difficulty. This is all intentional, aside from the buggy trash heap of Scarlet and Violet. The goal of the Pokemon company is to make the next generation fall in love with Pokemon. They already got me 20 years ago, they got some of you 15 years ago, and others 10 or even 5 years ago. The games are the entry point in the Pokemon business model, so they need to be simple and accessible, something children will pick up easily and fall in love with immediately. It's just like how Walt Disney pictured Disney Studios in 1957. Walt believed that films were just the entry point, a place to hook its audience, primarily children, with its incredible stories and characters. But the company really made money off what came with it. TV, music, amusement parks, merchandise, all these webs interconnect, creating the media behemoth we know today. And it plays a huge role in the downfall of Disney. They have forgotten why all these business arms work, the need to make good movies. Even if it's not the core moneymaker, it's the hook. It's what brings people into the Disney mania, giving us Disney adults. So just like Disney, I believe this is the Pokemon company's strategy. Pokemon games are meant to hook each new generation, bringing them to the shows or to the stores or the future amusement park rides, creating adults who care way too much and who say they're buying a Pikachu plushie for their kid, but it somehow ends up in their office instead. All this plays into the Disney model with each generation falling in love with the Pokemon games they had as a kid. Yes, in a lot of ways, the games have gotten worse and in some instances, unplayable. But part of the problem is that we want adult Pokemon games. We want to experience what we had as a kid, but in a new 
way. It's a huge reason why Pokemon Go was so successful. It was a callback to our childhood, but in a form we could enjoy as adults. And Niantic knew their audience. They didn't release Pokemon Go with new generations of Pokemon. They chose the first generation. They wanted to hook all those millennials, which is why the game has made over $6 billion. And your mind may be thinking, there, right there. That's a reason to make great games for adults. They make lots of money. But the problem is, it's hard to recreate the magic. The timing of Pokemon Go, the insane amount of hype around this game was unheard of. With all the right ingredients, this phone app still has only made $6 billion, where merch makes billions every year and it's stable. It's repeatable and it's growing. Like most companies, Nintendo is driven by making money consistently. They like making stupid money. And most of the time, making a great game that's innovative and groundbreaking makes them the most money like Tears of the Kingdom or Super Mario Odyssey. But in this situation, the real breadwinner for Pokemon is merchandise. So will we see better Pokemon games in the future? Hopefully. Will they make more experiences targeting adults? Probably not. But if these three companies start going down the road Disney is going, releasing games like this, people will choose other options and the love for the brand will decline. As Satoru Iwata once said, if we stay in one place, we will become outdated. Nintendo and the other Pokemon companies need to innovate. And if Pokemon is going to last another 10, 20, 50 years, becoming a behemoth to rival companies like Disney, they need to learn from Disney's mistakes and make games that work and that everyone can enjoy. This week's indie game highlight is Hellthrone, a fast-paced action roguelike game with bullet hell elements. Matt, a developer in our community, announced he's releasing the game on Steam the 15th of November. Hellthrone is tons of fun, and I highly suggest you pick up a copy when it releases. Please go support Matt and check out Hellthrone. Thanks so much.